Tap G and I love the theme park industry and especially our home parks like Disney World and Universal. But that's not to say they're perfect. Far from it. In fact, sometimes they do things that outright make us mad. Of course, we get frustrated over high ticket prices that were once as low as $5, or long lines, or food and souvenir prices, or crowds. But we get it. These kinds of issues happen when you're in a business. Inflation raises prices, to a point of course. Crowds and long lines happen because of the basic economic rule of supply and demand. By and large, these policies make good business sense. It's when these companies make changes or alterations where the inverse proportion of sense is less than or zero compared to the action. Like why a popular attraction may close down, as I've discussed before. But these examples are on a bigger scale of ludicrousness. There are business calls that in some small, sad way make sense or maybe more in the boardroom where we're not allowed to know. But to us, it's better applied if a monkey with a welding torch took over. Here is my list of grievances to Walt Disney World. Number 10. Uninspired writing. Let's play a little game. I'll recite a quote, you try to guess what it's from. Just pause the video if you want to challenge yourself. Here goes. Number 1. Welcome, foolish mortals. Number 2. Dead men tell no tales. Number 3. A salute to all nations, but mostly America. Number 4. Tonight's episode calls for a very different kind of introduction. And finally, five, thank the Phoenicians. They invented it. How'd you do? The first two were probably the easiest. That's because, for a while, Disney was the best at writing some of the best scripts in many of the best attractions. A good script, like in a movie, can make or break a good attraction, and requires good dialogue, good jokes, and good stories. In recent years, that trend has started to die off. For all its appeal, Mickey's Magic is all previously recorded music tracks and dialogue, save for a handful of lines by Mickey and Donald. Beauty and the Beast and The Little Mermaid are both recreated at Magic Kingdom and Disney's Hollywood Studios as essentially rehashing their stories instead of creating new ones. Some same with Frozen, only it has the novelty of narration with modern dialogue. Disney's stickiest issue is, and always has been, writing good jokes. Universal can get away with all sorts of tongue-in-cheek, snappy humor, beating the edgiest theme park. But Disney's stuck in their wholesome, family-friendly image. Pirates of the Caribbean had to scale back its debauchery due to complaints. How this affects their writings means the scripts cannot offend anyone. A great idea in theory, but this leads to jokes that don't pack any punch. Of course, humor doesn't need to be offensive to be funny, but if booger jokes are deemed too body for the Jungle Cruise, there's a problem. And forget self-referential humor, Disney's one big PR campaign trying to look as innocent as possible. So, make a joke about high ticket prices, Fast Pass Plus, or the overindulgence of Frozen? So sorry, can't risk looking bad. Number 9. New Technology Story Quality Dichotomy Disney lauds itself for technological breakthroughs in their attractions and quality storytelling. But again, let's go back to New Fantasyland. Lumiere and Enchanted Tales with Belle, as well as Madame Boudoir, are friggin' awesome! As are some of the animatronics on Seven Dwarfs My Train and Journey of the Little Mermaid. Yet again, since they just reenact their source material, it's pretty uninspired. How about the now defunct Legend of Jack Sparrow? Awesome tech, but a real mess of a narrative. Test Track relinquished its story about testing cars in favor of a new coat of Tron themed paint and letting people design their own cars. The Tiki Room upgraded its tech at the expense of the story. The entire story, mind you. The Grand Fiesta Tour starring the three caballeros at Epcot? It's all animated screens, but it has a flowing narrative. Same thing with The Seas with Nemo and Friends, and the Frozen sing-along. The story upgraded at Star Tours, the adventures continue, but the ride systems were relatively the same. What happened? Is there such a tight budget on story that they can only do one, the other, or neither? <coughs> Chester Hester's dinorama. <coughs> or worse, start out with sweet animatronics and supply a weak storyline, but let it break down and never fix it. Looking at you, Expedition Everest. Number 8. Selective Detail Application Again, Disney was once the unparalleled master at providing exquisite details on their attractions. Now, it only sometimes is. At Enchanted Tales with Belle, Journey into the Little Mermaid, and even Toy Story Midway Mania, someone forgot to put in a ceiling in some parts of their attractions. Is it critical? I suppose not, but uh, Disney made a name for themselves for applying this level of detail for total immersion. 
And yes, obviously in those attractions, we're not supposed to be staring up like we're at the Sistine Chapel, but come on, Disney, you're better than this! The Legend of Jack Sparrow had awesome technology and an awesome theater made to look like a cave. Even the mural outside was stunning. But the key was just a few benches, a handful of stanchions, and that was it. Its pre-show area was essentially a garage with a talking skull. Why skip on these details? Was it budget? That I can understand, but Disney learned long ago that investing heavily in details resulted in better public perception. The premier theater where the Frozen sing-along performs has no external theming. The outside of the building still looks like San Francisco. Not that I'm in favor of disrupting the established theming, but a six-foot sign at eye level statically does a worse job hailing down wayward guests than whatever they could have put up at the end of San Francisco Street. Granted, Hollywood Studios is the ultimate culprit, a park that once celebrated Hollywood by having all their rides and shows in giant boxy buildings is coming back to bite them. With their theme crumbling away from celebrating behind the scenes to rides about movies and stuff, Voyage of the Little Mermaid, Magic of Disney Animation, Disney Junior Live on Stage, and Jim Henson's Muppet Vision are all just square-shaped cookie-cutter edifices with minimal theming. That's just sad. Number 7. Saturation over certain intellectual properties. Ever since Harry Potter, Disney is convinced that the only way to a guest's heart is to use an established property, preferably film, to create their attractions. And because guests seem to love being in the world of Harry Potter for hours on end, Disney seems to figure that guests would love to be bombarded with their established blockbuster hits time and time again. Like Beauty and the Beast? Hope so! Belle and Beast star in two separate attractions are featured in Phantasmic Wishes, Princess Fairytale Hall, Mickey's Philhar Magic, Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom, Festival of Fantasy, and Celebrate the Magic, plus all the merchandise. It's not that it was a bad movie, far from it but there is such a thing as overdoing it. It's the same thing with The Little Mermaid. This issue dates back to when, after 2000, Disney movies were tanking with films like Atlantis, Treasure Planet, and Home on the Range. Since there weren't any current films to spawn into attractions, reach back 10, 15 years and say, hey, remember when we did this? Wasn't that awesome? Factor in the nostalgia and you've got a bona fide moneymaker. The Princesses, Tinkerbell, Alice in Wonderland, Stitch, Haunted Mansion, Pirates, these franchises dominate the parks in terms of merchandise. Pirates had four different attractions at one time, so there's something to be said about overdoing it on one franchise. And, you know, there's another set of Pirates films coming out in the next few years. Number 6. Avoidance of the Local Market Here in Central Florida, we are the tourism capital of the world. We attract millions of international visitors. So, by catering to visitors from abroad, Disney has to play the hand it's dealt with, right? In many ways, yes. But Disney has the power to hold two proverbial hands. For one thing, rewritability. How many Disney attractions boast true rewritability? The two Toy Story rides have you accumulate points, sure. Star Tours mixes things up to keep things fresh. And once you eliminate the thrill rides, what's left? As locals, we love the parks, but there's only so many times we can go on to Tom Sawyer Island, the Tiki Room, Winnie the Pooh, Hall of Presidents, Living with the Land, Imagination, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, or Peter Pan's Flight before they all just get stale. We suggested in our Philhar Magic episode that Donald's misadventures might benefit from changing up its scenarios, similar to Star Tours. Did you know the Country Bear Jamboree used to have a summer and a Christmas show? Did you know Disneyland's Haunted Mansion gets a Nightmare Before Christmas overhaul every holiday season? The rationale behind this is international guests supposedly want to see the originals untampered with, as though they're in some kind of stasis. But it clearly doesn't take a genius to see this argument doesn't hold any water. Oh, and those refillable mugs from the Disney resorts? Locals can get at most a two-week life out of those mugs. Why? From what we understand, the cost of soda seems to outweigh keeping guests happy and on a sugar high but it shuts out anyone local who might want in on some of that action. Besides, it's like those reusable grocery bags. You may get a lot of people who will buy them, but how many actually bring them back and use them? I hope this decision reverses because right now, many of us locals feel left out in favor of the guests from abroad. Thanks for listening to part one of the top 10 crimes committed by Disney. If you want to see part two, just click this annotation right over here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the other side.